So let's look at the statistics that are used to uh, understand uh, these different approaches. Um, and so if you just want to describe some data, uh, we have descriptive statistics. Those aren't necessarily exactly the same as the kind of descriptive approach, but they can be used in a descriptive approach. So just basically describing uh, the properties of an individual variable. It's mean, which is, is central tendency, median, and mode. Those are three different measures of central tendency. And the standard deviation is the measure of the variance or width of the distribution. We'll go through that in a second. Correlation tends to use scatter plots um, and, and these kind of linear regressions. Uh, and then finally, experiments, the, the critical statistics are a t-test or an ANOVA. Okay, so those are the different kind of characteristic uh, statistics associated with these different levels of understanding. So here's our uh, plot of descriptive statistics. Uh, and uh, so there's really two major factors. One is, as I said, the central tendency. Where is most of the data kind of peaked? Um, and so in a kind of standard distribution, what we call a normal or Gaussian distribution, uh, the mean, the median, and the mode are all right there at the same point. Um, but if you have a skewed distribution, which you often do, as you can see here, here's real data from UK income distribution. So how many, how much different people made in, in the UK, United Kingdom. You can see that the mean, the median, and the mode are actually at different points. And so the mean is actually kind of the average. The, you take each value, you add it up, and you divide by the number of values. That tends to be skewed by the high end in a skewed distribution. So we say this is a right skewed distribution, um, and, and there's uh, a large tail. This is income inequality. Uh, it means that there's a few people who are making a lot more money than everybody else, and that skews the mean upwards. And that's why typically, if you read the, the media, et cetera, uh, news reports about income tend to focus on the median, which is the point where half of the people are above and half of the people are below. So it's that kind of sense of midpoint um, where you kind of split the distribution in half and say, where is that dividing point in the halfway point? And then the mode finally is a la mode, the most popular way to eat the ice cream in the French, which is the point uh, where there is the most data, the peak. So the mode is the peak of the distribution, which in this case would be down here. And so the mode typically is the least sensitive to these kind of skew factors in the distribution, um, but it's also kind of noisy. It's not the best estimate because you can see, you know, if those little small differences in these peaks might move the mode around quite a bit whereas the median tends to be fairly robust. So most people use the median in the case of a skewed distribution. And if your data isn't skewed, then the mean is by far the most kind of robust statistic because it includes the contributions of all the data. Finally, we can look at the standard deviation. Here's a plot uh, of essentially the area under the curve in this normal kind of bell-shaped curve. Um, and you can see uh, that, like, for example, 95% of the area here of the data points in a normal distribution fall between minus 2 and plus 2 standard deviations. And that standard deviation is essentially just kind of a, a way of describing the width of, these, of this curve in a kind of standard way. Um, and that 95% is really critical because this is what we typically use as our standard of kind of truth in uh, inferential statistics. So if the chance of your result um, is out here in the, the tails of this distribution, so in other words, it's not in this central part, but out in the, in the extreme ends, um, then there's only a 5% chance that you could be out in those tails of the distribution just by random chance if your variable that you're looking at has essentially this kind of random uh, distribution according to this, this normal distribution. So in other words, um, if you just sort of like uh, generate numbers randomly, they'll most of the time follow this kind of normal distribution. Most There's a lot of natural processes 
that end up producing this sort of distribution of uh, random numbers that look like this. It's fairly rare to get a value of a number all the way out in the extreme ends of that distribution. And so this tells us kind of how chance works, right? And what we want to understand is in our inferential statistics, in particular where this comes up, how different is our data from chance? And so that's why it's so important to know about these standard deviations. Correlational data, the standard approach is to generate one of these scatter plots. So you plot literally the values in one of the variables along the x-axis and the other variable on the y-axis. And you plot each data point as you know a its corresponding value along both of those axes. And so the, the patterns that you typically see uh, here you see a, a perfect, very rare, you never see this in real data, uh, positive correlation going up like this, which means that the number of days breathing is exactly related to the age in years. <laughs> um, and a negative correlation is sort of the opposite direction. Um, it's equally strong of a relationship. It just happens that when one goes up, the other goes down. That's the slope. Um, and it's really kind of, uh, from a statistical perspective, kind of incidental, even though it looks very different and, and we put a negative number on it, um, it actually is very, very meaningful, just as meaningful as a positive relationship. So here we have miles per gallon on the x-axis and cost per gallon. Those are 100% related to each other. And so uh, you have that kind of curve. Here's a more interesting case over here where you have a zero correlation uh, which is plotting uh, musical ability at, in some scale on the x-axis and then a uh, person's height. And according to this data, there is no relationship between the height of an individual and their musical ability. And uh, therefore, you know, you see a uh, no overall slope. If you were to draw a line through these points, it would be flat horizontal across there indicating that there's no relationship. So the slope of the line in a scatter plot is essentially the correlation, the strength of the relationship, the co-relationship uh, among those two variables. And in this case, it's flat, the slope is zero. Um, here's a more realistic kind of uh, positive correlation where you uh, see income in relation to years of education. And you can see there's a positive relationship, but it's not perfect like you see above there. Uh, here's a moderate positive correlation uh, I think all this data is hypothetical, by the way, um, that just looks at SAT scores on the uh, y-axis versus GPA uh, for college freshmen. And you can see, according to this data, that SAT scores are reasonably predictive of GPA, uh, but not perfect. There are some people who have better or worse uh, GPA or SAT in relation to each other. Uh, finally, we have a kind of strong negative correlation uh, again, just as meaningful as a strong positive correlation. Here we have volume of air and uh, cartons of cigarettes. So a negative effect of smoking on the capacity of the lungs. Uh, and again, it's not perfect. Some of these lines go, some of these dots are not on a line, but they're generally speaking pretty strongly aligned. So here's this link. Um, I do recommend clicking on this when you download the slides. When you click that link, it takes you to this website. You can see all these funny relationships among random variables. So US spending on science, space, and technology correlates very strongly, okay, with suicides by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation. <laughs> what is this? Um, so just all kinds of funny examples. And so you can see, you know, it looks like uh, there's some kind of relationship among these different uh, variables, but in fact, there is no relationship um, because they're crazy, right? There's no way in which these factors could possibly be causally related. And yet uh, this shows you there's a great chance of things that look like they could be related, uh, but just physically aren't causally related. So keep that in mind. Every time you see a, a study telling you, you know, that, that uh, you know, some change in your behavior is going to result in a particular and some kind of health outcome, you have to realize that almost all those health outcome studies because they can't randomly assign people to these different conditions are reporting correlations and correlations do not always imply causation. There's a very reasonable chance that something else is driving the relationship and that something else could be just totally random chance or it could be some third variable 
Um, and so you don't really know from pure correlational data what the what's really driving it. The other thing to keep in mind for these scatter plots that's really important in practice is to look for these outliers. And this happens remarkably often in real world data. I think you know many times a year I will see a talk uh, or other papers uh, presenting data where there's these outliers up here on these scatter plots. And those, you can just imagine it, they have a really strong kind of leverage on the overall data. Where that exact point falls really influences how you draw a line between those data points. Um, and so a lot of times, if you got rid of that outlier point, you just sort of ignored that, um, and you tried to draw a line through these data points, that line would have a much lower slope. And that would mean that the relationship among those variables is much weaker than it otherwise appears. And so, uh, yeah, anytime you see a, a correlation, a strong correlation driven by that outlier, you really have to wonder, well, is that really just an effect of that one data point or does it really characterize the relationship among the rest of the variables? Okay, so these are kind of like super influencers in the data world. And it turns out that neuroimaging data, this amazing revolution that we have to look inside the brain is actually correlational in large part, okay? So it's looking at, changes in blood flow correlated with different kinds of mental activities. And because of that, it absolutely suffers from this same problem of interpreting, of interpreting correlational data. It, it, these changes that are happening in the brain are associated with uh, different conditions and different things, different ac mental activities, but they don't necessarily mean that they are driving that. And yet most people, when they look at this neuroimaging data say, aha, Here's the part of the brain that does X, where X is the thing that happened to be different in this study. And that's just a fundamental same confusion about what correlational data can tell us. Um, and again, it's extremely pervasive. So, you know, this is such a basic fact. I'm hammering it over and over again here because in the actual field of actual scientists doing actual science, it is so common and it's just kind of remarkable how many people don't really still appreciate this. So I hope you guys will really take this to heart and, and, and really understand that you can't make those kinds of inferences. And this particular study, this is kind of characteristic of a lot of these studies of, uh, in fMRI here. You're looking at the neural correlates of romantic love, okay? <laughs> and you've got all these different brain areas that are associated with uh, some score on some measure of romantic love and uh, and some are going up and some are going down. And, you know, the inference is these are the brain areas that drive romantic love. And of course, not only is that a specious kind of argument on the face of it without any corroborating evidence to support it, you also see this particular study has a massive outlier uh, way over here. And if you plot this data without that outlier, that slope of that line is really not going to be so strong, right? So uh, here it is, a published study recently, you know, this year, uh, making some pretty major errors, I think, in interpretation. Um, and yet this is the data that's getting published.